Good morning from Aceware headquarters, everyone. Thanks for joining us. In Kansas, we are thankful that our temperatures are going to be in the double digits on the positive side instead of the negative. It's supposed to get to a balmy 21 today, which is a great improvement over the negative 21 we had on Monday. You're here today with, we have, gosh, 27 schools represented with 15 states represented. And we have Chuck, Mike, and me that are here to talk about your course publication checklist. That list that includes all those details that you want to ensure are done before you go live with your online registration. While we are warming up here, can I get a show of hands from you right now that do you have a checklist you're using? Raise your hands if you do have a checklist you're using. Good job, Stacy, Yolanda. Good, good. Yeah, Brian from ICP. So good, good for you. Applause, applause to those of you that have some procedures in place. And if you see some things that we've overlooked in our checklist that we, we've developed along with some customer input, you know, be sure to share that with us in the chat box today. And I am going to be turning things over to Mike here shortly. He wants to know your comments, your questions, your suggestions. So put those in the chat box. And Chuck and I are taking a look at that. And so, Mike, I am turning things over to you now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Sharon, do you Sharon, mind do you muting mind yours, yours so I don't so hear the reverb? I don't know what Chuck said to me. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Like Sharon said, it is nicer out today than it has been for the past few days. Um, we're going to be going over today pre-checklist for publishing classes, uh, courses, programs, whatever your wording for the for that would be online. Some of you have those checklists already. The checklist that we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to start where I actually, I'm going to end where I start. This checklist that we're talking about today, we do have in a Word document online. You can download it. You can make changes to it. You can make additions because like Sharon said, you may have things that you want in yours that I don't cover that is in ours. Or you want to remove some things that you don't uh, do in the database that may be in our checklist, but it's available for download for anyone to have as your checklist so that you can modify it as you want. I believe it's a, a document folder or document file. And I'll probably end the session with saying the same exact thing that it'll be online as a reminder. So today's agenda, we're going to just jump right into this. And if you have questions, just shoot those in the chat message and we'll get to those as we can. But today's agenda will be checking your catalog information checking course information, checking your fees, checking your ACE web information, previewing what you've had in ACE web, and enabling editing of ACE web settings to make things go smoother. So when, when you're doing things, a, a lot of people make the common mistake that when they are building a course, that their course number and their course title, they do the same exact thing for the catalog name and the catalog code. Now that catalog code can, it is supposed to be used for, it can go span across a number of courses. So if the catalog description, you have the same course going on multiple times, uh, in a in a semester, in a year, or over a few years, but the catalog description is the same for them all, why not just use one catalog that just uses the same on each course? So you'd have build one catalog, and then you could put that actual catalog code across a number of classes so that you're not reinventing the wheel every single time. And we'll show some examples of that as we go along. You'll be checking the catalog descriptions with the term, date, time, as well as the primary and secondary description. Uh, helpful little hint, 
when you're looking at building a catalog, there's a primary description and it'll actually just say to have for plain text. Now the secondary description is in HTML. So you can build it in HTML, you can use plain text if you want, but if there's something, anything, and I don't know, I, and I, it could be a dot, a period in the secondary description. If there is something in that secondary description, AceWeb will use what's in the secondary description over the primary. So you could have written up this beautiful, beautiful description, and then in a secondary description, mistakenly put a space, put a period, put a, a letter, put a number, and what you would see online is what's in that big, old, that big old box with just the period or the space. It won't show anything for the primary. So if you want the primary to be one description to rule them all, then you'll just put a primary, but make sure that there is nothing in that secondary description. Um, we'll tell you, show you how to update catalog descriptions if necessary. Um, make it active and publish on web. Make sure that those are both checked so that they can be seen online to your users. Uh, making certain that the subject code is assigned to a catalog record as well as grouping codes. Uh, each course has its own grouping codes. Catalogs as well work with grouping codes. And checking prerequisites related and follow-up classes on the prerequisites tab. There is a list there that you can have related courses because your one class course program, your student or user may look at that and say, I can't really make it at that time. But if you have an, an, another class that's somewhat the same or is the same, you could put it as a related course where somebody could say, oh, I can see what other dates and times they're using doing this class and they can click on the courses. They may want to just sign up for it. What we're showing now is uh, uh, the look of the catalog builder screen. You have a code, you have a name, you have the subject, uh, publish on the web, and you'll notice that it's, it's kind of hidden. It's in the upper right where it says active, but publish in the web is right up there front and in the center. And like I said, you have the primary and you have the secondary. Go ahead, Sharon. So what you'll want to do first is when you're looking at these, you want to just really make sure that the content matches. So you'll notice that the name is Spring 2020, but in the primary description, it actually says 20, uh, March 20 to 22 in 2020. So that is actually correct. But if you're going to update these, you'll want to actually update it in both areas. Now, like I said before, if you want to use this on multiples and you don't put the dates in the description, the name of this could just be advanced report writing. And then the description could just be without dates and uh, dates, and you can be used across a number of advanced report writing classes. Go ahead. Now, do the primary and the secondary uh, descriptions match? In this case, they actually don't. One actually says, the date for the class and the secondary description does not. The other thing that you'll notice is in the secondary is there's the HTML tagging uh, with the, the carrots. Some of you may not know how to do that. Some of you may not uh, understand HTML coding. We have a little button in the upper right of the secondary that says generate HTML that can help you bold things, help you paragraph things. Sharon's high, or, uh, circling over it right now. And you can make hyperlinks. It puts the tagging in for you. So it's, it's like a easy button. Uh, if you've ever been to Staples, the easy button, that's what the generate HTML is. Go ahead with the next one, Sharon. I don't see that it went anywhere. Can you do it again? Okay. So the act Active box, uh, like I said, is up there in the upper right. You'll want to make sure that, for one, the the description is active, as well as go ahead, Sharon, that the public on the web is checkmarked. If either one of these two is not checked, it will not show up online. They both have to be. And some of you may say, well, if I have publish on web checked, why would it still not show if it's not active? It, it's kind of a double um, helper for you to make it, it's being seen. Go ahead, Sharon. The subject code, if you can search by subject code, and you can search by subject code in the calendar area as well as online, there's a way that you can search subjects. And when it's searching subject, it'll search the catalog subject as well as the course subject. Just another way for people to find you. And the grouping code area is in a, uh, a button on the right-hand side 
which is different than from the core screen. The core screen in the lower right hand side, there's a big box for grouping codes that actually looks like what happens when you click the grouping button. Uh, but just to show you, it's just a button on its own. So you make sure that the correct ones are listed there. Now the prerequisites tab has a write up for a prerequisite. So if you'll notice, the prerequisite, there is one for this class, which means you have got to have taken a course with this catalog before you can take this next one. So it's like taking a basic before you take an intermediate or taking an intermediate before you take an advanced and so on. And this is just a write up and it is up to you. Uh, you this does not have spell checking in it. So misspell all you want and it'll be shown online with the misspellings. But the prerequisites, you can have as many prerequisites as you want. And those are those are either ors. They're not ands that they have to take. Um, then here in the center, you have the related courses. So if you have any courses that kind of uh, are somewhat like or are like the class that you're showing here, 200, you can actually put as a related course. So when you're online, and we'll show this later on, that there's a little link that just says related, and then there's another one that says follow up. So if you have ACE 300, that'd be a follow-up course. Go ahead, Sharon. And the prerequisites, just make sure, are they correct? Are they still valid? Are there related courses for marketing? Those kind of things. Uh, you just wanna make sure that the codes are there. And that would be the catalog. Now we're gonna jump into the course side of things. So the check course title for outdated information, uh, checking the dates, times, location, and instructors. Checking the max, make sure that you have enough seats available versus the room, because if you do this often enough, you may change rooms for the semester. And if you have one with more or less seats, you'll wanna adjust the maximum. Check for room conflicts, especially if you're changing rooms. Check in the additional information items, which will show. Check the course notes to be printed on the receipts. Uh, if there's workshops, check the workshop information, and if they're for package courses, check the children courses and make sure that they're correct. And go ahead, Sharon, and I might pause there. Are there any questions so far? Okay, I okay. heard Chuck say we're good. Um, this is the core screen. I'm, uh, I'm assuming uh, that all of you have seen a core screen. The core screen is dedicated with the yellow at the bottom, and the catalog is, you'll notice the fifth item down on the left hand side where it says catalog code but this is the course screen where you have the course number you have the course title this is what people are going to see online for the the individual class program itself and I call it that because every place that I've talked to they refer to it as in a different way it could either be a class could be a course can be a program they're all the same in my book but this is where we go go ahead Sharon Okay, so does the title need updated? Uh, in this case, it would, because if you'll notice the dates as we get further down are 2021 dates, but the course title has spring 2020 in it. Uh, you'll wanna update that so that that way online, online, it's actually gonna say spring 2020. It's not gonna, ref and it'll actually show the dates. So you don't wanna come across looking like uh, maybe a fool because the course title does not match what the dates are. Go ahead, Sharon. Are the CEUs, hours, and credits correct for the class that you're using? Do you track CEUs? Do you track uh, track hours and do you track credits? If not, just leave them as zero. If you do, just make sure that they're updated. The minimum and the maximum over on the right side there, you'll wanna make sure that you have that correct. Now, helpful little hint here. If you have the maximum set to 50, and you'll notice that, oh, it's it's gone, it's underneath the hours and CEUs. It tells you how many are enrolled. If the number that are enrolled is, say, is 48, but the number of waiting are, are, are more than two, that means the number is above 50. Did you know that that means online nobody can enroll in this class? Because the number that are enrolled plus the number that are waiting, if they exceed the number of maximum, Online people can't re register for the class because we're assuming that you in the office know that there's a waiting list and you're gonna offer those waiting lists up. So we've stopped the publication from online from anybody being able to register in that class. Just a helpful little hint there that if somebody calls in and says, well, I can't register, you look at the map, you look at the enrollment. If they don't match or if one's lower, if the, the enrollment is lower than the maximum, make sure that there's nobody waiting for this class. 
the grouping codes. Grouping codes, you can have as many grouping codes as you want. You can either have, you can even have primary grouping codes, secondary grouping codes. This one does not, it has just multiple grouping codes. The reason you want that is because when somebody goes online and they look at the subject matter, you want this course to be in as many areas as possible so that it, it can be seen for where somebody may be clicking on. So that's just a, where we want to have the group right there. This is especially important when you're using Quick Pick. A lot of our schools, especially ones that are Ollie schools, use Quick Pick, which is a one page fill out. That one page fill out definitely uses grouping codes, so you really have to have those set correctly. Go ahead, Sharon. Dates and times. Okay, did you know that uh, November 11th, 2021 is not a Wednesday or a Thursday? If you looked it up, actually, I believe it is a Thursday, uh, but 11-12 is actually a Friday. So this would actually be incorrect. Now, when you put this in, when you put the begin date and you put the number of sessions, the actual date will check itself. And when you put the end date, it should automatically, when you check the days, go down and actually make the times correct. It should say Wednesday and Thursday from 8 to 5 because it pulls from everything above it. It pulls from the begin, the end date, sessions, the days of the week that you select, and the start and end time. Now, our start and end time, something else that's helpful is we do have noon and midnight, so make sure that when you're uh, doing noon and midnight, you select the right one because I don't know very many classes that start at midnight unless you're doing some kind of ghost tours down in, you know, Louisiana where you where you have ghost tours. Um, go ahead, Sharon. Uh, Mike, just to comment, I think what might have happened if Cheryl was messing with the different days of the class and then changed the begin date, it doesn't uncheck your day of the week uh, boxes. So you might have to pay attention to that if you're doing a lot of flipping with that start date. So Good, good, good information there, Chuck. Um, now, the location in the instructor, the location, we actually have building and room listed here, and then the location information will show below that. And then you have the instructor that's just a display. That's not where you can select the instructor. We have a tab for that up at the top. The fourth tab over on the top uh, is where you would select the instructor or s instructors. You can have multiple instructors for one class. The first instructor that you select is going to be your primary instructor. Go ahead, next, Sharon. The next one's going to be the print on receipt check mark box. Now the location information, do you want that to be shown when you print a receipt? You'll want to make sure that this is check marked. The reason why you would not want that is if it's a private location. The room use, which was right in the center of the screen. It was right next to the begin number of sessions, generate room use and room use. By the way, the G-E-N and R-U stands for generate room use. Uh, some of you may not know that. That's what it stands for. But the room use button will show if you have any conflict. It'll actually say yes there where you can double click and it'll actually take you to the course that's in conflict with it. So you can, uh, it doesn't stop you from assigning the Hilton Garden Inn for this, uh, for this building. It doesn't stop you if there's a conflict. It notifies you if there's a conflict. You can have two going on at the same time at the same location, it's up to you to look to see if there's a conflict and then change it if there is. Go ahead, Sharon. Okay, next up we have National Information tab where you have a number of items that you can select from, alternate course ID, registration times. Uh, what's being pointed at is attachment for the receipt. Now this attachment, uh, in this case, is looking for a PDF called Financial Planner that would be in your student manager folder. Now, it can be in a different directory, which you can find by clicking the three little dots button, if you could see that, that's underneath the and available. Uh, but this um, attachment will go out with email confirmations that you send from student manager as well as your online registration confirmations. The person's notified uh, BCC, go ahead and hit the next one that goes to that, is who do you need to have blind carbon copied on anything that happens with this course when it deals with email? So if anybody is registered in this class and you want this person notified, and you can have multiple. Now, how do you have multiple? The important thing to remember is email address, comma, the next email address. No space, just comma separating the email addresses, 
and you can have as many as that field can fill up and I believe that it's a pretty big one because some email addresses can get pretty long. This one also has membership requisites. Now remember on the catalog codes we are dealing with uh, prerequisites. So what is pre-required? This one's talking about requisites for the class. Or do you have the correct one? And this is pulling up um, your memberships that you must be signed up for before you can take the class. Go ahead, Sharon. Okay, going on now um, is the comments tab we wanna talk about. Now the notes here, bring your favorite report uh, to work and during class. You can type in here as much as you want. This is a memo field, you can free type, people can see this. Now go ahead with the next one. The next one, and here's what's important. This will actually show online and it will show on the registration confirmation that the person gets when they register online. However, we can shut it off from being shown online, but they still get it in the registration confirmation. Some of you may be saying, hmm, Mike, why would you wanna do that? This is where we recommend if you have hybrid online classes where you're doing Zoom classes or you're doing some other type of class where you need to include a link to that class, this is where you put it. That way it's not being shown online in the course information, but when somebody registers and they get their registration confirmation, that link is included in the registration confirmation. If you want to do that and you say, wow, that's really cool and I want to do that, get with your technician and we can walk you through it because over the last year and three months, that's been a big part of what we've been doing. I know it's been a big part of what you've been doing. And if you've been hassling of how do people get those links, there you go. Now for workshops, when you have a course, by default the course type is open, but if you change it to workshops, a button appears on the right hand side where you have the next prior. There's a button that says workshops and you can go in and you can build breakout sessions for a class. You'll wanna go in there, if it is a workshop type class, make sure that the, the code and the title and the the, the dates are, are correct. You still don't want to have 2020 dates. If you're if you're cloning a course, it will clone workshops. So just make sure that the dates are updated, the times are correct, and that the maximum, which is right above the time, make sure that that is correct. And if you are giving uh, CEUs and credit or CEUs and hours per the workshop, that you get those correct. Go ahead to the next one, Sharon. Packages. Course packaging is if you're signing up for one class and you get multiple, it's, a, it's basically a package deal. Um, that's something that's available in Student Manager. If you didn't know that, it's available. Uh, talk to your technician, call in and talk to, to Susan or talk to Sharon and they can help you out with some information on packages. We also have information online about packages, but in this case, we're gonna assume that you already knew it. Uh, package deals are make sure that you have the correct child class in a package. And what does that mean is in building a, a package, you have the parent course, where that's what they're signing up for, and then they get a bunch of children courses that go along with it. And you're building this to make sure that you have the right children courses in the package deal. Now, does each child course have the correct rate selected? You can do it one of two ways, and we can talk about that later on. But if you're building the packages, if you've build, been building the packages, you probably already know about the rate um, options, and you'll just want to make sure that there's you have the right package selected for the rates. Uh, tip for package courses, side note, you may also want to edit the course time field to say something like individual course times apply. Notice the course time there which is below the dates and the days of the week, whatever you type here, and you can over type or you can take out the M uh, through T 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., you could take that out and put what you want in there, and then that's what's displayed online, including in the confirmation. So if a parent gets you all the other child courses and it's not a course of its own, make sure that the course times say individual course times may apply or whatever your wording you want. Uh, ask your technician, I'm your technician, I'm a sentence all day long, so it may not be correct for you. Go ahead and go next, Sharon. Course fees. This is where a lot of people um, make magic or make mistakes. You can have as many main fees as you want. Notice that this is broken into two areas. You have main fees and you have other fees. 
When someone's registering online or within Student Manager, they get one main fee. They can get as many other optional fees as you want, but they only will get one main fee. So notice here we have an early bird fee that's set to expire. So on that date, which is past, it would actually roll down to the bottom of the fees. It would be set to hide on web, yes, and it would, and so nobody can select the early bird fee. That's the purpose of the early bird. The registration then becomes the first and primary fee. Uh, you can also have a member fee where you got a member code. So if, if a member is signing up online, even though you'll notice that the hide from web is yes, a member, if they're a member and they have that member code, they'll get that membership rate automatically. You don't have to do anything except to set it up on the course fees tab. Then we have a staff fee uh, that's also hidden from online. The other fees down at the bottom, the optional coupon and inventory, the first one we have is a coupon. Notice the amount has a negative sign preceding it. Very, very important if you want to give a discount is you got to have the negative. No side note, if it's below 99 cents, it's treated as a percentage. So if you put negative 0.99, the person that would be using the coupon code 2021, they would get 99% off of this course. So if you put negative 0.10, they're gonna get 10% off of it. So anything less than a dollar. Now I just got asked this last week. You cannot give 100% by putting 1.00, negative 1.00. That'll only actually give you just a dollar off. Uh, the only way to do that would be to make a coupon code with a negative amount of the registration fee itself. That would give you 100% off, but we don't have a way to actually say 100%. We also have an optional fee, and this is one of those, did he just say that? This is optional fee that is mandatory. So you'll notice that the mandatory, it says yes, and it's a book but it's down here in the other optional area. So it's an optional fee, but it's mandatory yes. So when somebody signs up, they don't get a selection of the book. The book is already selected and the fee is already assigned to it. Now you may be saying, Mike, why would you wanna do that when you could just include it into the main fee at the top? The main fee, the registration fee, they get a book with the registration fee. Well, some people may have inventory on the book. Some people may wanna have it show on the registration confirmation that, hey, you're, you're paying the fee and you're paying for a book. So you wanna have the actual wording, the, you may want to actually be able to trace that. Cloning courses also clone the latest course offered. So, you, oh yeah, when you're cloning, clone the latest course that's offered so you have the most up-to-date fee structure because courses, a lot of places do the same class over and over again, semester to semester, year to year. Make sure when you're doing cloning, you're not picking a class that's five years old because location, dates, times, um, fee structure, everything may have changed. Pick the uh, closest one to clone from. Go ahead and go there. ACE Web Information, which is a tab on the course screen. If you don't have access to it, you, you may not have a high enough user level or there's a preference to display that tab. But ACE Web Published Properties, you have a number of choices and in preferences, if you have access to your preferences, you have a default. Uh, when you're building a class, what you want the default published properties to be. In this case, it's publish register. If you allow for billing, you'll want to do publish uh, register allow billing, the topmost one there. Uh, you may be wondering the date field below that. Some of you may be looking at that saying, wait a minute, mine doesn't have that because this is kind of new. And I'm saying kind of new as in sometime in this year, the publish date is when you put a course or a date in here, this course will not show up online until that date has been met. That was a request from a customer and guess what had happened? Also a little side note, uh, 90, at least 90% of what the changes we make in the database are customer driven. So if you have a, a wish list that you'd like to see in the system, send it to your technician. We listen to our customers. We also have a data capture page where if for this particular course, I have a couple schools up in uh, South Dakota that do choir and they wanna know for just this particular class, what kind of instrument do you play? And we're doing some roommate type of thing. Do you need to have a roommate? Um, 
you don't want that for all courses. You just want to have it for the just this one course. Well, in this case, you can do that with what's called a data capture page. If you need to have information on that, get with your technician. We can work things out. Next thing is, do you allow waitlisting online? All that does is makes a little button. Remember before I said, if it's over the amount of maximum, nobody can register for it. Well, do you allow people online to say, hey, I want to be added to a waitlist in case you have cancellations. I want to be notified. I want, I want you to notify me. That's all that box is. Lag days. How many days before the course begin date, post course date, does the course still show up online? In this case, it's 60. So 60 days past the course date, course start date, this course will still show online. You may want to have it because you allow for late registration if you have three in there. Now, if you have a negative number, the negative number, if, if you put negative, I'll put it, say negative three, three days before the course begin date, this will fall offline and nobody can see it. Same thing goes for lag days for billing. Ace Web Info, oh, you can go ahead and go, Sharon. Uh, also in the Ace Web Info tab is a box that says workshop message. So if it's a workshop course and you say that they have to, if you have six workshops and you're saying, wait a minute, out of these six workshops, they've got to sign up for a minimum of three to be able to take this class. That way, if you put a little message in here, as well as setting the minimum and maximum, if they only selected two and they tried to proceed to checkout, they'd get a message that say, wait a minute, you haven't selected the minimum amount of workshops to register for this class. Just a little thing for you there. Uh, you can also preview the course online by clicking the blue wording that says preview ACEweb course status page. Now, it's not a button. It's just some wording. Click on that. Now, this works in conjunction with your system preferences. And in your system preferences, you click on preferences and you got a tab. There's an area there for your ACE web URL. Now, that must be filled out for this link for the preview ACE web course status page for that to work. If that's not filled out, that little blue thing that's highlighted will not work. Now, you can also make a course private. If you make the course private, you can actually preview the course. You can copy the actual uh, URL, and then you can send that to any you want to register where it's going to be a hidden link because you would change that publish properties back to no publish where nobody else can find it. But the link that you've highlighted and sent out to people still work for people. So it could be a hidden course. Go ahead and go next, Sharon. And this is what the what we've been talking about will look like online. When you click it, it'll actually open up to the course and show you what it's going to look like online. Enroll yourself, enroll someone else, the fees, the location instructor. You can have an go to go ahead and go next, Sharon, because I believe the next one is the instructor. Uh, and remember that hidden fees do not show in the fee breakdown. Location will be a write-up. It can also include HTML. So if you have some hyperlinks, you have some pictures, if you go next, Sharon, it is going to show up a picture. Unfortunately, it's not a picture of me. Actually, that's not unfortunate at all. That's actually very fortunate. It's a, it's a picture of our boss, Chuck. Uh, rather have him be seen than me. That's awesome. And then you have the session. So what days of the week does this go on? Times and location. You can have separate location per individual. And I'll say that again, you can have a specific location per session. So you can change that. And if you need to know how, get with your technician. Go ahead and go next, Sharon. Then you have the workshops. Um, the individual workshops, it, it has a write-up, has dates, has times, has a fee, if there's a fee assigned with each workshop, and then has the description. And then that related courses, where we were talking before on the catalog, if there are related courses, if there's not, there's not going to be anything. But these have links where you can click on it, and it'll open up courses that could be related to the class that we're talking about. OK, I and I settings. A lot of customers don't know about ACEweb I and I settings. A lot of people do, and I try and walk my uh, customers through their their ACEWEB INI settings and ACEWEB INI settings are 
how things are displayed, seen, done to and from student manager to your ACE web. Your ACE web is your online registration system and your student manager is your behind the scenes registration system and your ACE web INI is the working between the two systems. In this case, in dealing with a checklist of things to check off as you're building courses and in especially when it's coming time for registration start time, you really want to look at these INI settings. Do you allow deposits? Do you allow coupon limits? Is there a limit for the amount of coupons? Now, a lot of you may not have known because that's also somewhat new. There is a limit for how many coupons somebody can use. Uh, something else that may be new that you may not know about is escrow payments. Yes, if somebody has money, or in however some people pronounce it, monies. If some people have money left with you in an escrow placeholder account, they can now use that online if you let them use it. Now it's up to you and it's an INI setting. You have to agree to allow them to use it. Then they have to be able, then they would uh, use it. To get that, you'll want to get the latest ACE web update. But that's also a feature that customers have been asked for, for for a long, long time and that some of you may not have known was there. There's also a one-time coupon. That one-time coupon, if it is on, customers can use it. And it's just an INI, it's either on or off. And the one time is not like one time ever. It's one time during a time frame that you deem fit, either a semester, um, half a year, uh, a whole year, and, and you set the, the boundaries for that in your preferences. The workshop code match, that's something that's very important because if you have a number of tracks going on at the same time for sub courses for a conference, you can build your courses so that they're in sections and you can do it by the workshop code match. Have them offered at the same time so that they can only select one because they, they can't be in three places at one time. Go ahead and go next, Sharon. Bonus deals and setting up BOGOs. BOGO stands for buy one, get one. Now it doesn't mean buy one, get one free, and, and, but it could, and it's up to you. It's how you set things up. This one is a buy one, you get one at a discount. Uh, if you're running a different BOGO offer this term, you'll need to change the bonus deal setting. Now this is, that's not, again, it's a setting for you to choose and set up. Uh, for example, last term, you ran a buy one, get one free offer, but this ter term, you're going to do a, a twofer. You buy two and you get one free. So you set up the terms of what people are getting for the buy one, get one. Go ahead. Uh, now, here's something that is very important. And this one and the next one is during heavy traffic, when you activate a bunch of courses on one day and you say, uh, a lot of these for me are Ollie classes because they say, okay, on February 28th, we are turning all the courses on and people can go out and register. And guess what? Those people do it. That heavy rev uh, traffic that's done on the internet can bog down your online registration system. In doing so, we have a couple of ways to make it faster. For one, there is a, a flag in your INI called debug, debug, it's called debug flag setting. Now in this case, most of the time, Aceware you want to know if there's any kind of bug that's hit in the system as people are registering. But on heavy traffic days, like opening registration day, you may wanna change that so that you're not getting the heavy log of um, flags that you would on any other normal day. But you will want to turn that back on when the, like it says, when the heavy registration period is over, whether it be one day or whether it be a week. I have one school that open up individual, they have, I think three or four, I think they have four cities and they open registration on four given days, one per city. And so for those four days, we turn off the, the debugs flag setting because they have very high registration hitting those sites in, on those given days. Go ahead and go next, Sharon. Now, if you're using Quick Pick, Quick Pick is that one page registration page, which is different than the um, 
debug flagging that I just showed you on the previous screen, Quick Pick has its own set of INIs that's different. On that one, it has extended logging, which is normally on because you want to know if somebody's getting an error. Then the case of you have thousands of people that are going to be hitting your site in a matter of minutes because they're trying to fill up these classes as fast as can be. And, and hopefully that happens for you because that means money and we or monies and we want you all to get monies. Let's turn that extended logging off so that they're not you're not getting that it's not bogging down the system. But the important thing to remember is after your heavy registration time is to turn that back on. So if there is any errors, you know it and then you can let us know it. So other uh, INI settings that are very helpful that should be filled out, but you will want to check up on because the person may be gone, the person may have left, or you may have kicked him out, are the help email, help person, and help phone. Those are very handy because people see those on registration pages. They even get them in the email confirmation. So if they need to call someone, you want to make sure that those are up to date. The sender email and the sender name. This is very important because you may not want to make it look like it comes from an individual. You want, want to make it look like it comes from your organization. So if you have an info at your organization.com, .edu, .whatever, you can have that as the sender email and your sender name can just be um, International Center for Photography. I'll use them because I know that they're in attendance. So big shout out to them. And void pending payments. You may want to review this setting. I actually just read that verbatim because I was going to say that anyway. Um, do you allow the voiding of pending payments? Because when somebody is, is registering and the payment does not go through. So here is the huge misconception of uh, online payments. When you're registering online, on, on, when one of your customers is registering online, they pick their classes and then they click proceed to payment and they get taken to your payment gateway, whatever that payment gateway may be, your online registration system doesn't know what's happening until the register, register gets back to your payment or until they get back to your um, registration. So while they're out there, if the individual is registering, they're putting in their payment and they say, you know what, I'm done, I, I, I give up, That I can't have a credit card, and they just close the browser, well, you're your online registration system still sitting there going, I'm waiting to hear what's going on. They don't know that the individual bailed out or there is a power outage or there's a, there's a number of reasons why the individual did not return back to your registration system from your payment gateway. In those cases, those are called pending payments. Those pending payments are, we didn't hear back from your credit card authorization system for this individual, so they mark them as pay, pending. And this void pending payment setting is kind of deciding on what you're doing with those pending payments. Do you leave them as active? Do you cancel the registration? Do you delete the registration? So this is gonna be something that you wanna uh, look at. Now, the one that's in conjunction with this is failed payments. That's different because we've actually heard back from your payment provider that actually said the payment failed. Now, why would a payment failed? Insufficient funds, credit card stolen, something else, but we heard back from the payment gateway. So those two uh, INI settings are somewhat the same, but are different. The void pending payments, we never heard back from your payment provider as to what happened with the, the, the monies. Go ahead and go next year. Now, if you also need any INI editing help with Ace Web INI, Quick Pick INI, AWSIS INI, we have a few INIs out there. Get with your technician. Go ahead and go next there, Sharon. Your technician should be able to help you. If they can't, they can find the right answer by going to someone. I mean, we have the ability. So contact us with the INIs. If you, in fact, if you don't even know how to look at your INIs, one good thing is reach out to your technician and say, hey, I'd like to see what my INIs are. You may have a point of contact at your organization that knows where the INIs are. That's great. If you're that point of contact and you've never seen your INIs, let's get with your technician so that you can see those settings. Go ahead and go next, Sharon. Guess let's turn it over to you, Sharon. I don't know if there are any questions. Um, I do see a question, but you've answered it. 
um, about how you access those AceWeb INI settings, and and you told them to kind of get with their tech, and they could walk them walk them through those processes. So, Carol, if you jump in with your tech, they can kind of give you an overview of that area. Um, I'm um, going. I'm to going to. to uh, f make a couple of comments there, Mike. Uh, in talking about the BCC back on the course screen, and Sharon, I don't know if you can flip back to one of the screens, but the point is one of the other uses for that BCC is if you've got a partner that is presenting the course, Red Cross or a, a local company, that representative from the company may want to know real time who's registering for their class. And so again, that's a, that's a good place to put that blind carbon copy of, the, um, uh, of who else gets a registration confirmation notice. Um, other one was talking about the course setup and that is the, re the requisite courses uh, for like uh, the grouping code. Uh, those are a lot of times used, of course, your Ollie people, that in order to take a class, you must be a member of the OSHA program, and that's one use for that. The other note I wanted to follow up on, Mike, was your comment about packaging. Uh, there is a webinar about packaging. If you don't have it and want are curious about what it does for you, um, if you go to the webinar archive and look for the um, uh, the webinar archive, the uh, one is called uh, "Open the uh, uh, Bundling Module Under Your Tree." We did that uh, info around Christmas time and uh, used the Christmas uh, theme on that. Um, Sharon, what other things do you think we ought to cover? Uh, Mike, you've done a great job. Not much in the way of uh, questions on the docket. Um, Do we have any uh, examples from people that they submitted of their own? Other than the one from uh, Stacy, which was, again, kind of a timeline check-in. Um, and again, I think uh, we've got, as, my, as Sharon said, on the web, on the website, uh, under, I believe it's student manager resources, guides and white papers. There should be a, uh, let's see. The, I, can I uh, jump in here? Yeah. You're Go talking. For it. Go for it. Okay, and I just didn't want to. There's just some feedback from my mic on occasion. So, first, um, in a follow up email, I will be sending you all the direct link to the online checklist that Mike's gone through today. It was also a handout that many of you may have downloaded from reading the notes when you logged on. But if you have the link, there's some hyperlinks to help and things to explain everything in detail that Mike went over today. But then that checklist is yours to mock up or to go through or to add your own unique unique items. Chuck, there's a question here that I'll let you or Mike go through. Can you explain some of the publication differences between publisher register billing and things that would like some explanation on why and uh, times that you might not make a course published and you might be given that link to somebody else? Can you go through those publishing options and explain the difference? Right, and again, if you uh, if you out there would open your AceWeb info tab, what uh, Laura is talking about is the AceWeb publish properties, and her question was um, on the publish properties, why would you ever want a course to be not published but allow registration? Well, this is going back to that link to the course registration page, if you do in-house training and you want to allow people at XYZ Corporation to enroll in the class, but you don't want that class on your public open courses site, you can make the course no publish register, send the private link to that to the director of training at XYZ they share that internally with their staff. That means only the people who have the secret link to that registration page can go in and register. So that is exactly uh, the intent of that um, uh, private 
uh, publish option. And um, so that, uh, again, um, the other one, there is an option on it that says publish, register, billing only. Uh, that would be a couple of customers were having people who were registering for courses, paying by credit card, uh, and then the course would have to cancel because of lack of enrollment. Then when the company, when the school had to do the refund, they ended up eating the credit card processing fees. And so that's basically a little bit of a, uh, it, it basically allowed people to register for classes, say, bill me, and then uh, once the class made the minimum number, the program, uh, the school would then flip it to publish register. So that's kind of a unique situation on that business of the uh, publish on the web, but uh, billing only, uh, kind of a unique setup. Cheryl, uh, are there any, I mean, any others, Sharon? I don't see any other. Any other. Mike, you have any other uh, add-ons to those questions or notes before we let people go? Nope, I'm good. Except good. you mentioned that the mention next, the next. Sharon, can you mute? The next uh, webinar is going to be on March 18th, uh, again at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, like today, and it's going to be Radical Reporting Functions Part One, which indicates to me there's going to be a Part Two. I will jump in and hopefully not hurting people's ears too much. That's right. There is this is a three-part series on reporting functions. In part one, Chuck's going to give an overview and then do some diving into some actual report functions. So we hope to see you there on March 18th for the first part of this series. And with that, we'll wish you all a good day and a good weekend. And thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike.